Welcome back guys to another video in our attacking chess series. This is Molten and today we're going to be looking at an important opening concept on how you should use a lead in development. In this video I will take you through three examples which I believe highlight this concept very well so let's get straight into it. In this first position I chose, we can clearly see that black has developed all four minor pieces while white only has one. Therefore black might have been wondering during his game, well, where's my win? I've done exactly what all the chess books and GMs recommended I do, so where's my knockout punch? The short answer? There is none. Having a lead in development, even a huge one, doesn't necessarily mean you are immediately winning. It simply gives you an advantage and an opportunity to be well prepared when complications do arise. In order to take full advantage of a development lead, often we need to open the position and create lines of attack for our pieces. It is much more difficult to fully utilize it in a closed off position. However, before we even consider opening up the position, we should first get our king to safety with castling kingside, finishing off our development, knight f3, and for example, we can bring our rook into the game with rook to c8, creating some threats along the semi-open c file. Bishop e2, white's one move away from casting, therefore we need to create some distractions, if possible, with the move bishop to b6 here, opening up an attack on the knight on c3, and also looking to apply some pressure with moves such as bishop to a5, before white manages to get to safety. Here for example, white can play bishop to d2, and already, we have a very good move in this position, which utilizes two principles I've already taught you. Pawn to e5 is very good, since as I mentioned, our goal with a leading development is to open up the position before white is ready, and only with an open position will it make it a lot easier for us to utilize our advantage. Not only that, the move e5 also prevents white from castling, since castling also runs into pawn to d4, and let's say after knight a2, we win a clean piece with the move pawn to d3, trapping the bishop on e2. And this is all thanks to our development lead at the start of the game. But notice how we didn't really rush it. We finished everything first, and then we slowly created our threats and opened up the position. That's all I wanted to show you in this first example to highlight that it's much easier to utilize your leading development when you have an open position. And also, that a leading development in itself might give you an advantage but doesn't necessarily mean you have a winning position. Now let's move on to the second example. The second example is a game played by Boris Spassky with the white pieces and he uses his leading development and the two concepts we mentioned earlier to win a brilliant attacking game. Here we have a fairly normal position which has arised from the Queen's Gambit accepted. Here the most popular move nowadays is to play bishop to b7 and after rook d1 in this position black usually continues queen b6 and the main line continues after pawn to d5 takes and we get a mass exchange in the center and black manages to play bishop e7 white gets in the move e4 but black safely castles and usually the games continue bishop to e3 and we get a few more exchange of pieces. White gets the rook into the c4 square, but black maintains his pawn majority on the queen side with a fairly balanced position. Instead, in the game, black simply took on d4. White played rook d1, bishop b7, and here white took the pawn on d4, entering into what we call an isolated queen's pawn or IQP type position. Here, there are general plans for both sides, and playing against the IQP, what black wants to do here is blockade the square in front, which is the d5 square, as well as trading as many pieces as possible to get into a favorable end game where the d4 pawn will be more of a weakness than a strength. Whereas white wants to keep pieces on, generate an attack, as well as look to get rid of the pawn by playing the pawn push pawn to d5 at an ideal moment. Here black continues with his plan with knight to b4, looking to play the knight into the d5 square, blockading the pawn, and also finishing off his development on the king side. But here white uses his development lead as well as his IQP to his advantage to play a very strong move interfering with all of black's plans 
and that's to move pawn to d5, simply sacrificing the pawn, but he notices that black yet is to develop the bishop on f8, and is still uh, whiles away from casting. So opening up the center is very beneficial to utilize our advantage. Black must take it, and here white plays the move bishop to g5, putting tremendous amounts of pressure on black's position. We see that all his pieces are very active and on open lines of attack. The queen on e2 is pinning along the e-file, the rook is pinning the queen, the bishop is on an active square, and white's minor pieces are also actively applying pressure on black's d5 point. Already it's very difficult to find a move for black here since the threat of knight takes d5 is very strong. For example, if black simply moves the queen, with say the queen to c8 unpinning, well, white can simply win a piece with knight takes d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, and follow up with rook takes d5 at the end. Therefore, in this position, black played the move bishop to e7 to unpin from the e-file and try to get castled. However, now white can completely destroy black's pawn structure with the move bishop takes f6. Forcing black to take with the g pawn, since bishop takes f6 would run into knight takes d5. And after g takes f6, white simply captures the knight on d5. And after bishop takes, exchanges. Here white has a crushing position, since there are so many great outposts for his knights, as well as black having a lot of trouble to find a safe place to put his king. After the move, knight to d4, the knight is heading for the f5 square, as well as threats of knight c6 prevent black from even castling to the king side. Therefore black plays the move king f8, we chuck the knight into the outpost on f5, black played h5, and here already white has a winning tactic in this position to finish off the game. Spassky played the move rook takes d5, a very strong move here. And after queen takes d5, the idea is to play queen takes e7, king g8, and queen takes f6. With the dual threats of knight e7 check, forking the king and queen, and queen g7 check, mate. Both threats unstoppable, therefore black resigned here. A great attacking game by white, where he utilizes the concepts of the IQP as well as his development lead to undergo a very successful attack. Welcome back to the third example, and for this one I've chosen a game between Francesco Vallejo Pons with the white pieces against Ian Napomniachi with black. Here the game started 1e4, c5 Sicilian defense, Francesco plays knight c3, a6, knight g2. This is somewhat of a tricky move order where white is hinting at the close Sicilian but at any time he might switch to playing d4 and transpose into an open Sicilian. Ian plays d6. Since Ian's a knight off player with the black pieces, he's hoping white will play d4 here and transpose back to a mainline knight off. White plays g3, b5, bishop g2, bishop b7. And here finally, Francesco decides that it's a favorable variation for him to do so and he transposes back with the move pawn to d4. We get exchanges in the center, pawn to e6, white castles, and here instead of developing his pieces, Napomniachi goes for a very provocative move with the pawn push b4, attacking the knight on c3. Now here white can retreat the knight to a4, e2, but we also have a third option which we should keep in mind in similar positions, which tries to utilize the fact that Black is still poorly developed on the king side, so we immediately try to open lines around the center of the board. And that's the knight sacrifice, knight to d5. Now here if black doesn't accept the sacrifice, then simply we've moved our knight into the center of the board onto an aggressive square for free. Therefore if black takes it, the idea is to take it back, opening up the e-file. Here for example, black played the move bishop to c8, however, if he plays any casual move such as say knight f6, our idea for white is to play rook to e1 check. And already it's very difficult for black to block the diagonal since bishop to e7 will run into knight to f5, not allowing black time to castle to safety. 
and if black is forced to play a move such as king to d7 then already we've achieved what we wanted by um, forcing the king into an open position where we're free to attack. Therefore black played the move bishop to c8 but as we can see this is further underdeveloping and for the cost of one knight this is definitely worth it for white since in this particular position on move 10 black has not developed a single piece. White continued rook e1 check, bishop to e7 was played, and here white continues to open lines in the position. He starts with the move pawn to c4. Notice that we're a piece down, but we're in no particular rush since as long as black is still stuck with the king in the center, we'll always have some initiative in this position. Another thing to notice here is that as white, we don't necessarily have any clear win in this position, and the fact that we sacrifice the piece um, we gain it back in compensation. So as long as we play actively in this position and we continue to use our initiative and leading development that we've been given, then our position should always be um, slightly in our favor. After the move c4, for example, white is already threatening to play queen to a4 check in some positions, as well as ideas of, say, bishop to g5 and perhaps knight to c6 in some positions. Therefore, black was obliged in the game to already give away castling with the move king to f8, just to relieve some of the pressure. Here white plays an ex excellent move to open lines in the position further with the move pawn to a3. So his idea is to bring more pieces into the attack. If black takes it, then we take back with the rook and now the rook will rook lift along the third rank and come into the game via e3 or f3 squares. Bishop to g5 is played by black to try and trade off some pieces. White obliges, since after this trades, white has an excellent move to continue his attack and that's to move knight to e6 check. So as I said in my previous videos, the goal here is to simply put your pieces on active squares and fully develop and utilize all the pieces and resources you have. And since black has not developed a single piece, um, it's very likely that there's going to be tactics in our favor. The idea of knight e6 check is that after black takes it with the pawn, we take back with the pawn, sacrificing a second piece. However, it's very difficult for black now to defend the rook in the corner and he's losing the piece back. For example, if he plays rook a7 to defend the attacked rook, white can simply play queen takes d6. And for example, queen e7 to block the check, we can simply take the knight in the corner. And after queen c7, do we trade queens? Of course we don't trade queens because we're a piece down and we want to keep our attack going. So queen to b4 check makes sense. And after queen e7, again we don't trade queens, we can simply prevent this with the move pawn to c5 and here white clearly has a huge attack to follow, black's king's in the center and it doesn't matter at all the fact that we're a piece down because our attack is just way too strong. Instead in the game black played the move pawn to d5, white played rook to f3 check, knight f6, here white wants to take the pawn on d5 but doesn't want to take it with the pawn, he wants to take it with the queen in order to continue his initiative and threaten um, checks along the back rank as well as um, at the rook in the corner. However the queen on g5 prevents this, therefore white plays the move pawn to h4, kicking the queen off to a square where it can't defend the d5 pawn since queen to h5 runs into rook's f6 check. And we simply pick up the queen on h5. Therefore black had to play queen g6 and now white goes queen takes d5, rook a7 was played, the only move to defend the rook, and here white finds a forcing combination to finish off the game with pawn to e7 check. Of course black should take this pawn because king e8 will run into a queen check on the back rank. And after the exchanges, king h2, king takes e7, white has a simply forcing way to 
um, finish off the game here with rook to e3 check bishop e6 was played however if the king goes back then it's no better since queen c5 check king f7 and rook e7 check would finish off the game king g6 would run into queen g5 checkmate while the move king to f8 will run into discovered checks for example rook to a7 check king g8 followed by queen takes c8 knight a8 queen takes e8 checkmate on the back rank therefore black played bishop e6 However, here we can simply take the bishop to finish off the game. Checkmate will follow, for example, after king f8, queen e7 check, king g8. And here we can simply play bishop to d5 check, with the idea that knight takes d5 will be followed by a nice back rank mate on e8. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusion of this video on development lead. I hope you guys found it useful and learned something along the way. Thanks for watching this video and until the next one. If you guys enjoyed this video, remember to hit that subscribe button and tap that notification bell so you get notifications every time I upload a new video.